Welcome everybody. We are letting the room populate and we'll get started momentarily. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Just a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and we will make the link available after the presentation. You are also muted and we ask that you stay muted so that everybody can hear uh, the speakers. If you do have questions, please put them in the chat. Thank you very much. Mark, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Margie, and uh, that that it goes for dogs as well. So we want to hear their voice loud and clear. Uh, so thank you for joining uh, Tobin Talks on uh, March 9th. Uh, we are celebrating International Women's Month. International Women's Day was yesterday. And if you hadn't uh, had a chance to listen to our International Women's Day Summit, uh, please uh, listen to the recording. Uh, it was really superb. It was a great, great discussion. So uh, please uh, take a listen. Uh, that's going to be posted if it hasn't already been. Um, I want to welcome uh, my guest today. Uh, it is Karen Patman. Uh, she is uh, the first woman chair of Metro. Uh, and she's going to help me explore our topic, which is a woman's place is in the house and the Senate. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the advancement of women in politics. Um, Karen was appointed uh, as Metro Chair in 2016 by Mayor Sylvester Turner. Uh, she was previously a partner in Bracewell LLP, uh, where for three decades she worked as a trial lawyer and was the first woman elected to the firm's seven-member management committee. Uh, she's a founding board member of the Center for Women in Law at the University of Texas School of Law and a senior trustee of the UT Law School Foundation. Among her many, many honors, uh, Karen also received ADL's uh, Karen H. Sussman Jurisprudence Award. Uh, and we are privileged to have her join uh, Tobin Talks today. Uh, Karen, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Mark? I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, we, we go way back. Um, I remember first meeting you uh, sometime, I think it was in, is in the early 90s, it was. Uh, which, you know, I think coincidentally kind of uh, syncs up with the kind of period of time that I'd like for us to cover because, um, you know, in 1993, for example, 10% uh, of, of members of Congress were women, 22% uh, uh, of statewide office holders were women, uh, and 20% uh, of state legislators were women. Let's look now in 2021, 26%, uh, almost 27% of members of Congress are women. Statewide elected officials, 30%, and 30% of members of state legislators are now women. There's still a lot of room for, for growth and for uh, equal representation. Women actually make up uh, over 50% uh, of the population in this country. Um, but you have been a part of politics. Uh, you have obviously experienced a lot of firsts as a woman uh, in your career. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this progression? Uh, that well, you've experienced. And, by the way, hello to everybody. And I really appreciate being asked to join you all. Mark and I do go way back. We don't want to go, you know, we're not old <laughs> enough to go as far back as we do. So, uh, but we were both very involved in democratic politics here for many years. And 
So I'm just really glad to be with you all. And I guess one of the reasons Mark thought of me for this discussion is because I grew up in a family of politicians. Um, Both my dad and grandfather served in Congress and my mother was on the Democratic National Committee and I myself ran very unsuccessfully for Congress in 1994. I think it was a very elite group of supporters. Uh, Mark Tobin was, I think, one of them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and Sherry Murphish and a number of people you would know. But um, but it was a great experience. And I've followed politics closely my whole life and worked heavily in the vineyards in it as well. And I do think, I think there really has been a sea change. And one of the biggest drivers of Democratic women in politics has been the group Emily's List. Um, It was founded by Ellen Malcolm, who is a Pillsbury heir, really smart, dedicated woman. And she looked around and saw so few women in the halls of Congress and legislatures. And she thought, I can do something about that. And so the, the, the problem was at that time, women couldn't raise money. Um, there, that's where the bias really was, is the ability to actually command. They weren't in these business positions. They weren't uh, connected with people that just forked over checks. Um, and so Ellen decided that she would start this group, Emily's List. And Emily stands for Early Money is Like Yeast. It makes the dough rise. If, in fact, you get money in, at the outset, when you're running for something, the rest will follow because you'll suddenly be seen as a viable candidate and you can raise money, uh, even from more traditional sources. So she founded this group and um, I was an Emily's List candidate, so it didn't always work, but uh, it was it was very instrumental in in, in, in make, making women viable candidates. Because the election uh, polling has always shown that voters trust women more to be honest in the job. They recognize that certain qualities women bring to it are necessary and important for public service. Nancy Pelosi likes to say that the best preparation ever for dealing with the Democratic caucus and for Congress is having raised five children born in six years. and that made her, one of the columnists said she was impregnable to hormonal people screaming, I hate you, you know, because uh, she had five teenagers at one time. So dealing with Donald Trump was a piece of cake. You know, she didn't, wasn't faced by him at all. So, but getting back to it. So I think that really, really helped. And then there were a few events like, and these were more in the, uh, Uh, Well, these were in the early 90s, weren't they? The Anita Hill hearings and that sort of thing, where suddenly women realized that men just did not get, no apologies to you guys. Um, Our president was a little slow to get it too, Joe Biden, and he would be the first to admit that uh, because he was presiding over the Anita Hill hearings. And isn't he wonderful, by the way, folks? But at any rate, um, we are we are a a, a nonpartisan organization. Yes, I know you just are. I know you are. Day. But there was there was one candidate that fomented hate, and one candidate that didn't. So I think we can, you know, I think you we, on the ADL mission at least. Um, but at any rate, yes, I, okay, it's nonpartisan. But at any rate. Uh, So I think that these factors coalesce together to, first of all, help women learn the tools of the trade. Emily's List always also had candidate training and, you know, Ann Richards used to, um, even when she was county commissioner of Travis County, and I knew Governor Richards pretty well because I was a contemporary of her kids. And she made it her mission what she won a county commissioner seat and ultimately a governor's seat but during that interim to train women there was the texas women political caucus and they'd have these conventions and 
Um, she would literally go, here's how you do it. You go door to door, you make an index card with everybody. And so I think you had women out there supporting other women. And once women became viable candidates, uh, really the rest was history. We're still behind the curve, but you're just seeing an explosion. And frankly, um, I think this is a nonpartisan factoid. The presidency of the last four years spawned a lot of women to run. Lizzie Fletcher, for example, is outstanding candidate. Sherry Murfish and I left it all in the field to get her elected in 2018. And um, I'm just so proud of her, doing great. But, but she was somebody that said, what can I do about this? What can I do about this? Uh, and somebody said, she said, I may, maybe I should run for the state legislature. And somebody said, no, run for Congress. Sherry did, recruited her. And, um, she did, and but, but it was a spawn by the fact that we, I've got to step up and do something. So that's a long-winded answer to a simple question. And um, so anyway. So, and, and, and by the way, just to, to be clear, I mean, there's also been, well, I, I think the, the percentage increase is greater on the Democratic side. There's also been an increase on of Republican women engaged as well. They, there are, that, that's exactly right. My friend, um, Cindy Siegel, who was on the Metro board with me, ran in, in that seat, CD7 last time. And I think that, I mean, I, I'm told that the strategy of the Republican party now is to recruit as many women and candidates of color as they can uh, because they see that as a real asset in running. Um, and so, I mean, you, you talk about um, the training and early money and, you know, motivation of, of women, you know, to, to get in politics um, as, you know, I think three of the, the, the main factors, you know, that, that we're seeing, um, what, you know, like the, we talked about, you know, early in the show, there's 26% of uh, Congress is, is represented by women and 51% of the, of our country are, are female. Um, what do you think uh, needs to happen or what steps need to occur or, or well, maybe nothing has to change. Maybe, maybe it's where it's on the right track and it's just a matter of time. I think where we're still falling short, um, and of course we're not represented in our percentages, but, but I think that there is at least critical mass. Um, and that's really important. There's sort of a rule of on a corporate board or a nonprofit board, it's good to have one third, uh, which according to these statistics, we don't have, but one third women, because that's a critical mass where actually women can influence the policy. And I think that, but I think we in, in Congress and the US Senate, you know, we're doing pretty well. The trajectory is going pretty well. Where we're having trouble is cracking the as Hillary would say, the, 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 the toughest glass ceiling of all, and that's the presidency. And um, that's yet to come, I feel confident, but there is, you know, I'm sure we've all seen it, but no matter whom you supported in 2016, um, the coverage, I thought, of Hillary was just brutal, um, more so much, much more so than the opposing fellow. And many studies have been done on that that demonstrates that the negative coverage of her, if you took all the ads and you uh, analyzed them, um, and if you took the news coverage and analyzed the content of that, negative versus positive, she was overwhelmingly the victim of that. And there is something about seeking that ultimate brass ring that brings out uh, 
um, people that are very resistant to that. And, and let me uh, I, I, explore that for a second, and, and perhaps maybe we can do that um, separate from looking at at that at that race because uh, I think a lot of the issues are reflective and probably a lot of, of uh, experiences that you've had and, and other women have had when they have attempted to, to move up the ladder. Um, and, and so what are some of those you know, challenges that, and whether it was Hillary or any other woman who's seeking the presidency or uh, a woman who is seeking a, a, to be a CEO or whatever that leadership level is uh, that, that is, so, it is so challenging and so tough to overcome um, that that you have found because you you know as you said at the uh, in your introduction you've you've had a lot of firsts as as a woman. Well, I think it's the same old trap, which is you can't be too nice because then you're not seen as tough and capable, but you can't be. Uh, you have to walk this really careful line on aggressiveness or otherwise you're seen as a witch and people shut down. And it's a really, really tough line to walk. I remember when I started at the law firm, there were very few, well, there were the, the first three women trial lawyers in Houston started at the same time. There were three of us. And they absolutely, this was in 1982, they had no idea what to make of us. They, they had a hard time remembering which of us were which. And, uh, and, and they just had no idea. What were they, they all named Carr and Patman? I mean, was they, that... weren't, they weren't. In fact, and one of them um, was Black, this fantastic person, a friend of mine who uh, was in UT Law, moot court champion, et cetera. But they still, you know, they saw us as a, as a unit and we were, we were good friends um, because, you know, we were throwing in the same thing together, but they, you know, I, I remember being told at one point I got a review that, oh, uh, well, you know, probably not partnership material. And so I asked a really good friend of mine who was a mentor um, and he said, you know, you just, you need to smile less. When you get in the elevator, look serious you know so then i tried looking serious and this is this anecdote will tell it all when i first <laughs> we had this the great richard roids who some of you may have known who was a mentor of mine magnificent man um he had this uh Con, this little group where he, he, he divided all the attorneys and had we had these individual little groups where you would sit next at, to somebody at lunch and debrief them about themselves and they would debrief you and then you'd each present to the group on the other person. So this guy that was next to me said, tell me about yourself. So by that point I had the game. I said, you know, I just love litigation. I, my practice is my life. I'm yeah, I love the law and I adore, love what I do, like to try cases. Um, well, aren't you involved with politics? Yes, I am, but that takes a back seat to my trial practice. I'm, you know, and so I it goes over and over again. So when it comes his time to talk, here's what he says to the group. He says, Karen, and he looked at me beaming, knowing I would be so pleased at what he was going to say. He said, Karen is first and foremost a Southern lady. <laughs> and then she's a Democrat and she's a trial lawyer. <laughs> you just can't win. But that was that was 30, almost 40 years ago. So we've come a long way since then. And, uh, but I did have to deal with all the stereotypes. Why is she doing this? You know, my family, um, uh, had been blessed financially. Well, she doesn't have to do this. Why is she doing this? Isn't she just going to quit and get married and all this? So there were all the stereotypes and, um, and is she tough enough? And I just can't imagine her in court and, you know, dealt with all of that. And then ultimately I had the honor of being the first woman elected to the Bracewell Managed Com Committee where I had a real 
ability to dispel those stereotypes about other women coming up the ranks. And so that was just a real blessing, came full circle. And once you point out the inherent uh, biases and misperceptions, the guys recognize it. You know, we we go down compensation while well, Joe Schmo needs to go up, be bumped up. But Susie, well, does she really need a bump? And I say, no, wait a minute. Her numbers are the same. Her contributions are the same. And they go, you're right. She kind of needs to go up. So it, having the old phrase is, you know, if you don't, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I found that to be very important. And that's why we need. Uh, female representation everywhere and representation of color as well. Absolutely. I, I just was wondering if you wouldn't mind just sharing some of your, you know, experience growing up in a family of politics. And, you know, I know, uh, <laughs> for example, there's a famous piece of legislation um, that I think has, is it your father or grandfather's okay, name right. on it? Yes. Uh, right, right, Patman, um, which antitrust of my law school uh, memory serves me which doesn't always so you got it you, you know got it. how uh what was that what was that like and i know you said that it influenced you but maybe you could elaborate a little bit well it was it was just um i was i knew my granddad well i adored him you know revered him and it was a real blessing and my grandmother too merle his wife but yes we would go to washington and um he was a very effective legislator. He has a number of pieces of legislation that he spearheaded, uh, including federal credit union legislation. And the federal credit union is named after him, the Wright-Patman Federal Credit Union. In fact, it used to be on the card that they all carry around the, the um, congressman, but I don't think it's there anymore, but his portrait is in the credit union. But at any rate, he was a very twinkly, um, fun, shrewd, tough, fearless guy. And he, if you had to equate his economic policy with anybody on the current scene, it would be Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> In fact, when I met Elizabeth Warren, she said, oh my gosh, are you, right related to right pattern and she goes i taught him in my class in my in my class at law school i taught your grandfather's economic philosophy and then i had a similar experience uh he was also the first congressman to investigate watergate he was chairman of the banking committee and he figured out that the plumbers you know the ones that broke into the D democratic national committee that the money had been laundered through Mexico. He had all of his investigators on it and they were really digging in to the corruption. Plus he couldn't stand Nixon. In the end, he was, um, when Nixon's enemies list was published, granddaddy was on it. I was never more proud, but he, and he knew something was going on because his tax returns were being audited. They actually thought they were being bugged, but at any rate, and they probably were, but Anyway, Adam Schiff, so, so what happened was he opens these hearings on Watergate and the Nixon administration, John Dean writes about this in his book, went all out to keep him from getting subpoena power. Uh, they were scared to death of the Patman hearings and they did, they succeeded. Gerald Ford lobbied all these, all these congressmen and the subpoena power went down 20 to 15. So granddad had these empty chair hearings that were covered and all this, that kind of thing. And then he turned his material over to Ted Kennedy and ultimately obviously the urban committee in the Senate. But, um, Adam Schiff called me up about two years ago because you remember Devin Nunes had just shut his committee down and he called me up and of course he was calling for money. It wasn't that he wanted to, but I love Adam Schiff. We have subsequently become friends, but he said, are you related to Wright Patman? said, yes. He goes, well, I identify with him because his committee was shut down and my committee was just shut down too. And so anyway, subsequently we forged a friendship and, um, that's a long way, but granddaddy was an exceptional guy and I'm really, really proud of him. And there's a new book out, a relatively new by somebody named Matt Stoller called Goliath, which deals in part with my granddad, but a number of other people too. But just the notion being that uh, 
you know, public democratic policy has somewhat been co-opted by the very institutions that granddad used to rail against. One thing he always wanted was an audit of the Federal Reserve and that never passed while he was there. And ultimately uh, now there is one, I believe. So with with your 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 experiences, both from you know the your family experiences in, in growing up and and obviously the ones that you have forged yourself, uh, what what advice would you provide to uh, to whether it's a, a a girl in in school now or a young woman who is just starting her career about you know facing gender inequality? Well, I think you just have to barrel through. I think you have to just know your power, as Nancy Pelosi would say. That's her mantra. Know your power. Um, don't let your confidence be diminished by the term of the day is microaggressions, of course. And, but also be able to roll with some things. You know, you, you have to be able to put in perspective ham-handed, stupid remarks or uh misperceptions you have to be able to do that because most people what who said the quote that uh gosh I, I'm, I'm gonna mangle this but that's right to, to succeed you have to have people that want you to succeed and both men and women so be charitable i mean don't put up with sexual harassment and predatory behavior and that kind of thing. Uh, but you have to be a little charitable with people, people trying to help you. And you have to overlook those that aren't, that aren't going to do it. So I, it, it may be one of the, the, the ways to talk about it is that there are some people who are educated, that you can educate. Mm -hmm. And you have to look for those opportunities um, when, when they exist. We all know that there are some people who probably aren't worth the time or energy and that probably just whatever you say or do you know may not um you know produce some sort of positive um result but when when there is a, a person where uh like you said you know in your in your firm law firm days where just by helping explain that they were able to uh to, to change um, to look for those opportunities. Well, and let me say this. I think things have changed a lot. I mean, I, my anecdotes are almost 35 to 40 years old, although I will say, I mean, the, the initial ones, the ones I told now, but uh, today, but, and there were blocks all the way, and there still are. Nobody should go into it naive. It is better, though. It is better, though. People have had daughters come through the ranks and realize what they experienced. Um, uh, they've had wives in the workforce. They, it is better. It's, but you, you can't, you have to have your guard up. And we, we just have a couple more minutes and I don't know if there's any, any questions from, from any of the participants. Uh, so please weigh in. Um, can, can, I, can I mention one other thing, Karen? You, you had a fairly direct, um, role model in terms of, of women being involved in politics in your family. Uh, you might want to you might want to mention the other Karen as part of that process. Oh well. gosh! Oh Paul, you're on. Hi. Hi. Hi there. How are you? I'm good. I'm great. Paul and I. Golly, it's wonderful to see you. We're Likewise. friends. I never get to see him though. Yes, my mother was. Um, that's very sweet of you. Her the the real Karen is she would put it. Yeah, well, she was uh, called Big Karen, Big Karen, and, yeah. Big Karen and Little Karen. That was Little Karen, and um, she was a real dynamo. I was just so blessed. She passed away a couple years ago, but she was very involved with the state Democratic Party. She was opposed to winner take all primaries. At one point, we actually had a winner take all primary. Um, she was on the foreground of bringing women and people of color into the process. 
And she was also on the Democratic National Committee at one point, and she ran all my dad's campaigns. My dad also was a politician. He was in the state Senate for 20 years and in Congress for four. He was so my she, boss for a while there. He was the vice chair of Senate Ed when I was research director. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Well, and of course, there's no finer servant than Paul Colbert, public servant. Just a really stellar fella. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Paul, for that. And uh, thank you, Karin, uh, for joining us and, and sharing uh, your experiences and your thoughts and, and your advice uh, and helping us celebrate uh, Women's uh, International Month. Um, as I said, we have a lot to celebrate, but we also still have work to do. Um, and thank uh, everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, and you've seen some notices about some upcoming events, including uh, on uh, Wednesday, March 16th, uh, we are holding our first in uh, a series on understanding systemic racism. Uh, this will be understanding systemic racism uh, in the healthcare industry. It is Wednesday, March 16th at noon. Uh, so please join us then. We'll look forward to seeing you. Uh, thanks so much. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thanks so much.